Well, praise the Lord, saints. Um, can can you all hear me? Good. Okay, um, saints. In the last session, well, before I talk about the last session, I like I just would like to impress you with the title of this message this morning. I would implore you not to think that you've heard this before. I guarantee you, no matter how long you've been in the recovery, have you ever heard a title like this? Think about it. This, this is awesome. The process of dispositional sanctification being the process of our organic salvation as our beautification. Did you ever realize our organic salvation is our beautification? Okay, it is our beautification to become the holy and glorious bride for Christ. That is the burden of this message this morning. I hope you would, um, you know, after this meeting sometime, I hope you would even pray this title back to the Lord so that it penetrates your being. Um, to me, it's quite awesome and quite wonderful. Now, before I get into the outline itself, you remember in the previous message, we said that there are three aspects of the sanctification in the scriptures. And uh, one aspect is the seeking, the seeking sanctification of the spirit. Another aspect is the positional sanctification of the spirit. And the final aspect is the dispositional, uh, the dispositional sanctification of the spirit. Um, you, you know, forgive me, I just have to pause here, practical note. You know, sometimes I hear an echo or I hear someone speaking. Uh, uh, Jim and Seth, maybe you could let the saints know to put it on mute while I'm speaking and then they can unmute when I'm done. Is that okay, brothers? Yes, Brother Ed, and, we, and Seth and I are watching it. And as soon as we hear any hint of a noise, we go in and we, we mute. Okay, thank you, brother. That helps me. Okay, now um, let me say this. You know, in Luke 15, it's quite remarkable to me, we can see all three aspects of the spirit sanctification, of these particular three aspects. Um, and I'm not going to put them in exact order according to the three parables there. But in Luke 15, verse 8, we see the seeking sanctification of the Spirit. We see a woman with a broom. Saints, the Spirit is signified by a woman with a broom. How about that? And she loses, she has 10 coins. She loses one of the coins. We were, we were, that lost coin. We were that lost sheep. We were that lost coin. We were that lost son. You remember the father said, we have to rejoice because my son was lost and now he has been found. So each of those parables uses the word lost. And now with the seeking sanctification of spirit, we see this woman and, um, what she does, she loses one of the coins. She lights a lamp, you know, to search the room. And that lamp signifies the word of God, which is used by the spirit to illuminate and expose the sinner's position and condition that he might repent. And then uh, she sweeps the house. This is to search and cleanse the sinner's inward parts. Then, I believe it's verse 4, or maybe I'm wrong, not verse 4, but uh, it goes on to say that she seeks carefully. I like this. You know, the Spirit sought us out carefully. Um, and so, you know, the first parable about the son as the shepherd seeking the lost sheep, that took place outside the sinner and was completed at the cross through his redemptive death. 
But here with this woman, uh, the spirit seeking is inward and is carried out by his working within the repenting sinner, within the repenting sinner. Um, you know, it's amazing, saints, before we were regenerated, the spirit uh, illuminated and exposed our position and our condition so that we could repent. And, and the lamp signifies the word. I still remember, and I was an unbeliever at this time. Uh, I was just out of college. I was working for Penn's Oil Company in Houston. And some of us went to lunch. And uh, as we were eating lunch, this, this young man stood up in the restaurant. I said, oh, no, what's going to happen now? And you know what happened? He said this. He said, I want to let all of you know that the Lord Jesus is coming back and you better get ready. And he left the restaurant. And in one day I said, you know, why, why is he coming here and bothering our lunch? You know, I was having a good lunch. And he said, but listen, as I was walking back to work, it was, it was like the spirit was brooding over me saying, you know, I said to myself, what if what he said is true? And then I said to myself, if what he said is true, I'm in big trouble. Uh, because I have read the Gospels. And so uh, that was the spirit seeking sanctification with me. Now we have the positional sanctification. I'll speak about this in a little bit. But our focus is dispositional sanctification, which is uh, positional sanctification is our being separated under God. But the reason why we're separated under God is so that we could be saturated with God. That is the dispositional sanctification of our, of our, you know, of our being. And uh, remember, when we speak about our disposition, our disposition is what we are in our makeup by birth. Like John 3, 6 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we don't want to have our Christian life. We don't want anything in our Christian lives to have anything to do with the flesh. That is what we are. You could say John 3, 6, that first part is what we are in our makeup by birth. Actually, we can say that our disposition is, is the self. It's the self. And, um, you know, saints, I would say this, the source of any rebellion and every rebellion among us was the natural disposition of the persons involved. And the primary element of natural disposition is ambition for position, ambition for position. You might think, well, Brother Ed, I'm not ambitious for position, but you've been infected because of the fall. You know, Satan, he was ambition for God's position. He said, I will sit on the throne. Who was on the throne? God was on the throne. He wanted to dethrone God. Saints, you know what? Here's a definition of sin. Sin is a dethronement of God. When you dethrone God, when you put yourself on the throne, that is sin. But we need our disposition to be sanctified by being soaked and saturated with the processed and consummated triune God as the Spirit, the Holy, to make us as holy as the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Now, um, Saint, it's, it's amazing to me that our natural disposition, of course, is what we are in our makeup by birth. It's also the self, the self. But it, it's it's if you even in the, in the human realm, when you have children, even shortly after they're born and they're growing up, you can see their natural disposition. You can see that this 
little boy, he has a particular makeup that this other little boy does not have. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going into the animal kingdom now, you know, because I have a dog. You know, I had a dog before this. What they were in their makeup by birth is totally different. Um, even in the, in, the, in, the, in the physical realm, it's quite amazing. The dog I had before this dog, uh, he had a particular makeup by his birth. The dog I have now, when he was a puppy, he was so uh, energetic, so active. Uh, not like my first dog. Not only that, when he was a puppy, I would put him on my lap and he would bite me. He had, he had his teeth were like razors. And he would just bite my hand, bite my hand, not in a malicious way, but it really hurt. And uh, it even caused me to bleed. I said, Ruthie, you know, I don't know if we should have gotten this dog. I mean, he's biting me all the time. And, um, you know, I didn't choose to get that dog. My son brought it home. He said, Dad, can we have this dog? And then my wife chimed in, Ed, can we have that dog? Well, what am I going to do? I said, okay, we'll have the dog. I said, but I told my son, you have to take care of it. Well, I'm thinking, uh, at first, Ruthie and I were the ones who took care of it. Now, he takes care of it also, which I'm very happy about that. But not only with, 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 with children that are born, you can see what they are in their makeup by birth. And so, saints, all of the rebellions were caused by the self. And the primary uh, element of the self is ambition for position. So what the spirit does when he dispositionally sanctifies us, he outwardly corrects us. We'll see this as we go through the outline. And he inwardly supplies us with the divine element. He infuses us with the riches of Christ and saturates us with God as the Holy One for us to become the Holy City. And the Holy City is the New Jerusalem as the Holy and Glorious Bride for Christ. Now, I'd like to come back to Luke 15 just to point these aspects of sanctification to you, of course, we have the story of the prodigal son, and um, we pointed this out, I believe, last night, that when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the land, and he joined himself to one of the citizens of the country he was in, and this particular citizen, he sent the prodigal son into his fields to feed hogs. I mean, that was really bad for, uh, uh, you know, any Jewish person at that time. Uh, it was reprehensible. It was really an unclean animal. It also goes on to say, it says he longed to be satisfied with the carob pods, which the hogs were eating. So he was, he, not only was he taking care of hogs, he was eating the same food that they were eating. Now, there's a note in our recovery version on carob pods. And it says this, carob pods were used as fodder to feed animals and destitute persons. Now, I like this next sentence. An interesting rabbinical saying is that, quote, when the Israelites are reduced to carob pods, then they repent. Uh, I think that, I don't know, I think a lot of us were reduced to carob pods, and then we repented. You know, I can't see Scott Finney on the screen, but I, I know, you know, what Scott did uh, before he came into church life. I think he would testify that 
he, he was reduced to Karen Potts and uh, he repented. You know, he, uh, I think uh, Rick Anderson knocked on his uh, door of his dormitory. Am I right, Jim? I can see you, Jim. Yeah. And um, that was so wonderful. So wonderful. Well, um, you know, I talked about that woman lighting a lamp, sweeping the house. What that did to this prodigal son, as he was feeding on these carapods, it says he came to himself. Now, that was a result of the seeking sanctification of the spirit. He came to himself. He said, you know, you know, my father's servants, they abound in bread. I'm here perishing in famine. I will rise up and go to my father and say to my father, you know, we had a speech worked up. So he rose up and came to his own father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. This indicates the father was looking for him in a daily way. And I really like this. If you're close to someone and they're a long way off, you can tell who they are. Um, you know, Otsuo knows me. If I was a long way off from Otsuo and I was coming toward him, he would look and maybe some brothers next to him wouldn't know, but he would say, that's brother Ed Marks uh, because of Otsuo and I's relationship. So uh, the father immediately said, that's my son. So he ran to his son. Uh, he embraced him, kissed him, and uh, then the then the son started with his speech. And uh, the son said to him, "Son and such." And I like verse twenty two. It says, "But the father said." Again, that word "but" is a great word in the scriptures. We were going this way, but but God who is rich in mercy, that's Ephesians 2, because of the great love with which he loved us. You just look up that word, but it, it, it's a big term in your Christian life. And uh, it's a big turn, even disp dispensationally. Okay, the father interrupted his speech and he told his slaves, bring out quickly the best robe and put it on him. Now we shared... Uh, yeah, yesterday, that that best robe signifies Christ as the God-satisfying righteousness to cover the penitent sinner. It also signifies our positional sanctification by the blood of Christ. When he put on that robe, he was separated unto his father. And so the best robe also signifies our positional sanctification. Now, we know I talked yesterday about the significance of the ring and the sandals. But then the father concluded, he said, bring the fattened calf, slaughter it, and let us eat and be merry. Saints, our church life, our Christian life is a life, a life of eating the Lord and being merry. I hope that in this meeting, you will be feeding on the Lord Jesus as your spiritual food, and you will be merry, M-E-R-R-Y. Actually, this, this whole chapter shows the merriment of the Father. And so um, that fattened calf, I was looking in the ministry again this morning, the latter part of our brother's ministry, that fattened calf that, that he was going to eat, of course, signifies the rich Christ killed on the cross for our enjoyment in resurrection. And that fattened calf that we feast on points to our dispositional sanctification. So in this whole parable, you have the seeking, this whole chapter, which shows the love of the triune God for sinners. You have the seeking sanctification of the spirit. You have the positional sanctification of the spirit. And you have 
the dispositional sanctification of the spirit. You know, when I was considering this, I was considering what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 6a, the first part of 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He said this, and the God who said, out of darkness, light shall shine, is the one who shined in our hearts. And I'll just stop right there. When Paul said this, the God who said, out of darkness, light shall shine, is the one who shined in our hearts. The God who said, out of darkness, light shall shine, he took his salvation experience all the way back to the first three chapters of Genesis. He indicated those first three verses are a picture of my salvation. Because in those first three verses, we know, of course, verse one says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, and the earth became waste and empty or waste and void. And then it says, and the spirit of God brooded over the face of the death waters. Saints, the spirit's brooding signifies the seeking sanctification of the spirit. The spirit was brooding over us. The same Hebrew word is used in Deuteronomy 32, 11, where it says that God is like an eagle who hovers over his young. You know, he hovers over his young. Well, we didn't know it. We were unbelievers, or maybe we were a believer. We were away from the Lord, from the center of the Lord's move. We didn't realize it, but the Spirit was hovering over us. Isn't that wonderful? I'm so glad for the hovering Spirit. That is the seeking sanctification of the Spirit. So it says, the Spirit brooded over the face of the waters. And then what happened? It says, and God said. You see, you see, Paul said, and the God who said. Genesis 1 said, and God said. Paul says, and the God who said, let there be light. Uh, and the God who said, shined in our hearts. Now, in Genesis, it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, what we see here is that there were three major instruments that the Lord used to bring forth life. And that is the spirit, the word, and the light. The spirit is the brooding spirit. The word is seen where it says, and God said. And Paul said, and the God who said. We need to know God as the God who said. He is the God who said. Not only that, he is the spirit who says. Uh, you know, out of darkness, light shall shine. He shined in our hearts. So what we have is the spirit, the word, and the light. They were used by God to generate life for the fulfillment of God's purpose. And so you can say the spirit, the word, and the light are all of life. And I really like this. Christ as the spirit is the reality of God. Christ as the word is the speaking of God. And Christ as the light is the shining of God. I really like this. We experienced all of this uh, so that God could dispense himself into us as life to regenerate us. All right, now let's come to Roman number one. And to me, this is quite spectacular. I don't know, I, I don't know if you've ever realized this before, but Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 reveals the entirety of God's complete salvation in presenting Christ to us in three stages. You know, we have this book, The Organic Aspect, of God's salvation. This was the first conference where Brother Lee began to teach, speak about God's complete salvation. That conference was given in Chinese and translated into English. Now let's see how 
these three verses talk about the entirety of God's complete salvation. A says, in the past, Christ as the Redeemer, notice I underline the words, the Redeemer, gave himself up for the church for our judicial redemption. So verse 25 says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that was on the cross to accomplish judicial redemption, to purchase the church, to purchase the church. Now, let me skip over to C, to C. I won't say B first, I'll say C. Let's, we see now the past. Let's look into eternity future. C says, in the future, Christ as the bridegroom will present the church to himself as his counterpart for his satisfaction. Then verse 27 says that he might present the church to himself glorious, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that she would be holy and without blemish. This is our glorification for bride presentation. Now let's come to be. We see the past. We see the future. What links the past with the future is B. So we, B has to be a re, living reality to us day by day by day. It says in the present, Christ as the life-giving spirit is dispositionally sanctifying the church by saturating her. Don't, that word saturating is very important. Use that word in your prayer to the Lord. Say, Lord, saturate me today um, with your element. And this goes on to say, so that she may be his counterpart. This is organic salvation as what? As bride beautification and bride preparation. And verse 26 says that he might sanctify her, cleansing her, by the washing of the water in the word. Now, if we look at this in its entirety, firstly, we see Christ as a redeemer in the past, accomplishing his judicial redemption. Then in the present, we see Christ as the life-giving spirit, uh, you know, um, sanctifying us by cleansing us uh, through the washing of the water in the word. That's our organic salvation. And things, our organic salvation, and I'll abbreviate our organic salvation, regeneration, transformation, and glorification. That organic salvation, and of course there's, there's sanctification in there, of course, that organic salvation is broad beautification. That organic salvation is broad preparation. Without verse 26, we cannot be prepared to be Christ's bride. Without verse 26, we cannot be beautified to be Christ's bride. So firstly, we have Christ as our redeemer in verse 25. Secondly, uh, in verse 26, we have Christ as the life-giving spirit. Thirdly, in verse 27, we have Christ as the bridegroom. So as the Redeemer, he accomplishes judicial redemption. As the life-giving spirit, he carries out organic salvation, which is, uh, which is when he does this, saint, he is beautifying us. And we'll see what that means. And he is preparing us to be his bride. And in the future, he is the bridegroom for bride presentation. Uh, that brings us to D. D says, in the past, in the past, Christ gave himself up for the church. In the present, he is sanctifying the church. And in the future, he will present the church to himself as his counterpart for his satisfaction. Therefore, his loving the church to sanctify her and his sanctifying the church is for his presenting the church to himself glorious. All right, now, 
That brings us to Roman numeral two. And this first part up to the semicolon is very important. The Lord's primary work in the recovery is his genuine work to prepare his bride. That is the Lord's primary work in his recovery, and it's his genuine work to prepare us to be his bride. You remember in Revelation 19, 7, it says, the wife has made herself ready. How do we make ourselves ready? It's by remaining in that process of dispositional sanctification so that we can be saturated with the triune God embodied in Christ, realized as a life-giving spirit by the spirits cleansing us by the washing of the water in the word that is his primary work in the recovery and that is how we make ourselves ready for his second coming uh, i'll go on after the uh, semicolon it says apart from the continual dispositional sanctification spoken of in ephesians 5 26 there is no way for the bride to be prepared and it's no way for Revelation 19, 7 through 9, to be fulfilled. The process of dispositional sanctification, which are these verses in 1 Thessalonians, we talked about, about them yesterday, is the process of our organic salvation as our beautification to become the beautiful, holy, and glorious bride for Christ. Saints, never forget that the primary work and the Lord's up-to-date recovery is his genuine work to prepare his bride. This is why we are in the Lord's present recovery. It is so that we can open our whole being to him day by day to be soaked with him, to be saturated with him, uh, so that we can be more and more prepared to be his bride. And according to Revelation 19, Seven, this is the wife making herself ready. We'll speak a little bit more about this later. Now, let's unpack this statement in Roman numeral 2. A says, Christ as the life-giving spirit sanctifies the church by cleansing her according to the washing of the water in the word. According to the divine concept, water here refers to the flowing life of God typified by flowing water. We are now in such a washing process. I like this, a washing process. Saints, let's keep ourselves in this washing process in order that the church may be holy and without blemish. Of course, I've got all these verses here that show that uh, you know that the uh, that uh, the water here refers to the flowing life of God, typified by flowing water. And uh, just very briefly, you know, in Exodus seventeen six, remember the Lord charged Moses. You know, there were there were approximately two million Israelites, you know, going through the wilderness, and they became thirsty. And so there was a rock there. And God told Moses, I want you to strike the rock and water will come out of the rock so that the people may drink. The saints, that was a lot of water. Enough water for two million people. Think about it. And who does that rock signify? First Corinthians 10, 4, Paul says, he's talking about the Israelites. They all drank the same spiritual drink. Saints, we're drinking the same spiritual drink this morning. We are, uh, we drink a holy beverage every day. And so, in other words, our drink actually is the spirit. It, it goes on to say, for they drank of a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now, John 7, 37 through 39 
said, the Lord said on the last day of the feast, he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And saints, again, I say, just pray short, simple prayers over this. Again, you know, all of these scriptures need to be incorporated into our conversations with the Lord. We need to build up a habit of talking to the Lord. And uh, we can say, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. I'm thirsty. I want to drink. And then the Lord goes on to say, he who believes into me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. So you have these true two words in these verses, drink and flow, drink and flow. In the life study of Exodus, there's a whole life study that talks about these two words, drink and flow. Saints, this is our Christian life for our church life. It's a matter of drinking and flowing. If you can, Now listen to this. If you don't drink of the Spirit, you can't flow out the Spirit. I would also say this. If you do not flow out the Spirit, you will not drink the Spirit. Eventually, in the life study of Exodus, Brother Lee said this, if you, ha if you have not allowed the Spirit to flow out of your being, you know, and mostly that's through speaking, speaking the Lord into one another. Uh, if we go for quite a while and we don't do that, he said this, this is, this is a warning. We will lose our thirst. Saying that's a very serious condition to be in, to lose your thirst for the Lord. We don't want to lose our, our thirst for the Lord. So we need to flow out. And uh, in that life study, uh, the illustration of a hose, you know, a water hose was given. And our brother said, how can you tell if the hose is drinking water? The way you can tell that hose is drinking water is if water is coming out of the hose. If, if water is flowing out of the hose, the hose is drinking water. So we need to be like that hose. We need to drink and flow. We need to flow and drink. Um, you know, saints, I still remember when I was, uh, oh, you know, from the time I was eight years old, we'd be, uh, you know, in the summer, even though I grew up in Pittsburgh, it was hot in the summer, humid too. And uh, we would get very thirsty. And uh, I told my, <laughs> you know, my friends, I said, come to my yard. I have a hose. We have a hose there. So you turn on the faucet. And when you, okay, I would take the lead to, to, to drink. When I first took the first drink of that water, it was rusty. It was rusty. I just spit it out. So the water had to flow a while. Oh, then it was so clear, so cold, so refreshing. Saints, uh, if we haven't flown out the Lord for a long period of time, and then we do flow him out, which we need to do, uh, what comes out of us may at first be rusty. Don't be bothered by that. Just keep flowing. Eventually, the water will be crystal clear and refreshing. Um, so I'll just say that much. Now, in Revelation 7, 17, this is a picture of eternity. And saints, I love this verse because it shows for eternity. We are going to be shepherded by the Lord. It says the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. And you know what he's going to do in eternity and for eternity? He is going to guide us to springs of waters of life. That is his shepherding. Um, okay, I'll just uh, mention those verses. Now let's come to B. The Greek word for washing in Ephesians 5.26 is literally labor. In the Old Testament, the priests used the laver to wash away their earthly defilement day by day. Then it goes, day, goes, on, goes on, 
day by day, morning and evening. We need to come to the Bible and be cleansed by the laver of the water in the Word. All right, now I'll go on to see. She says Paul uses the word rhema when he speaks of the Word with its washing process. It's the washing of the water in the rhema. It's not the washing of the water in the logos. The logos is God's written word. The rhema, I want to say logos is God's word, objectively recorded in the Bible. Rhema is the word of God spoken to us on a specific occasion. And I just pray right now that this would be a, a specific occasion to each one of us where the Lord speaks to us personally, uh, presently, uh, and corporately even. But we need to get the personal speaking of the Lord in his corporate speaking to us, in his speaking to us corporately. I'll, let me say it this way. Maybe I said this in a previous meeting, forgive me if I did, but Rama is the word of God spoken to you that has your name on it, your name on it. It's almost like if I have an envelope and I write something on it and I put on the front of the, of the envelope, um, Atsuo Miyake. And so he gets that envelope and it's a word from me with his name on it. It's my personal speaking to Atsuo. So he opens up, he reads it. I would hope he would get encouraged by whatever I said to him. Um, but that's what Rhema is to us. It's God's word, his instant, present, spoken word addressed to us specifically, uh, privately, and intimately with our name on it. And it's spoken to us on a specific occasion. Now, all these verses uh, use the word rhema. Like, for instance, Mark 14, Mark 14, 72. You remember the Lord told Peter, Peter said, I will never deny you, Lord. And the Lord said, Peter, before, you know, the rooster crows, you, you'll deny me three times. And so in Mark 14, 72, by that time, Peter had denied the Lord. And if you, if you read the way he denied the Lord, it, it wasn't good. I mean, he thought he was so, how do I say he trusted in his natural man to the uttermost. He trusted in his natural absoluteness to the uttermost. You know, I, I'm thinking of a brother right now who was prominent among us, and um, he's not among us anymore. He was very absolute. And, you know, then he departed even was involved in a rebellious turmoil. And I could never forget what Brother Howard Agashi said to me because he loved this brother. He wanted his brother to be recovered and so did Brother Lee. He said, Brother Ed, I just want to let you know, this brother has never been broken. He's never been broken by the Lord. In other words, you could be an absolute person in your natural being. That natural absoluteness needs to be broken by the Lord through the environment and through his dispensing inwardly, cooperating. The spirit is doing something inwardly by dispensing himself into you. He's doing something outwardly in the environment to break your natural man, even to break your natural absoluteness. So this is what he did with Peter. He broke Peter's natural absoluteness because Peter denied the Lord three times. I don't know if you remember the third time this little maid, this little girl, she said, surely you were one of them. You were one of these disciples. 
it says that Peter cursed and he 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 said to this little maid around these ones uh that he was not he was not a person who was uh close to Jesus and he denied the Lord even even cursing and then it says this Mark 14 72 says this and Peter remembered the word how Jesus had said to him before a rooster crows twice you will deny me three times and thinking upon it he wept saints when that happened Peter Peter's natural absoluteness was broken. From that point, he needed, he, he realized that in order to love the Lord, he needed the Lord's love. He needed to love the Lord with the Lord as his love. If he was going to be absolute for the Lord, he needed the Lord, the Lord to be his absoluteness. Now, just say that much. Now, if you come to Luke 1, 35 to 38, you remember the angelic messenger came to Mary and uh, told her that she would, she would conceive a son and, um, you know, which was from the, the Holy Spirit, out of the Holy Spirit. And I love what Mary said. She said this, and we should say this in our Christian life and in our service to the Lord in the church life. She said, behold, the slave of the Lord, may it happen to me according to your rhema, your rhema, your word, your in instant present speaking to me. In other words, she recognized that that angelic messenger, whatever he spoke to her, was from God because he was a messenger from God. Now, in Luke 5, 5, you remember Peter, of course, he was a professional fisherman, and uh, the Lord could see him out on the sea, and the disciples that were in the boat with him, and they fished the whole night. They didn't catch one fish. And so the Lord told them, um, let down your nets on the other side of the boat. And so it says, Simon answered and said, Master, through the whole night we toiled and caught nothing. But based on your rhema, I will let down the nets. Based on your word, I will let down the nets. That was rhema, uh, God's instant personal speaking to Simon. When, when Simon Peter, when he brought up the nets, it was full of fish and, and I love Peter so much, and I appreciate him. One of the reasons I appreciate him is because he made so many mistakes, and I'm the same way. And so it encourages me. You know, you know, Peter, it was amazing. Through all of those mistakes, the Lord kept him. First of all, he stuck around. Secondly, the Lord would not let him go. Uh, I appreciate him so much. So when they got to shore, this was so amazing to Peter that Peter was so enlightened. He said to the Lord, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Uh, you know, the Lord didn't say he was a sinful man, but he was in the presence of the Lord. Uh, this happened, and he realized he was a sinful man. And so the Lord said to him, he said, Peter, you know, he said, from henceforth, I will make you a fisher of men. I will make you a person who literally, I think the footnote says this, catches men alive. You know, the fish are dead when you catch them. But when you catch these fish, you're going to catch men alive. And so uh, that was a wonderful word. Now, in Luke 24... Uh, verses 1 through 8, this was after the Lord died. Uh, it was the first day of the week. It was early dawn, and some sisters came to the tomb where Jesus was placed, They and they, listen to this. It says they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. 
They must have been amazed. I'll just give you a little sidebar here, saying, you know, the sisters really love the Lord. One time, Brother Lee said to me, no, no, brothers and sisters, don't, you know, don't take this too far, what I'm about to say to you. But Brother Lee did say this to me. He said, you know, Ed, the sisters love the Lord more than the brothers. Now, why did he say that? He said, because, Ed, look at, look at after the Lord died, who were, who were the ones who stuck around? Who were the ones who were there? It was the sisters. And the sisters, you know, after this experience at the tomb, they went back and told the disciples. And the disciples, you know, these sisters are saying things that are, you know, they, they didn't believe them. Well, thank the Lord for the sisters. We all need to be like these sisters who love the Lord to the uttermost. So it says they entered the tomb. They didn't find the Lord's body. But I love this. It says two men stood by them in dazzling clothing. These were angels. It says they became frightened. They bowed their faces to the ground. And these two men, who were angelic uh, messengers, they asked a question to them. I like this. Why are you seeking the living one among the dead? He's the living one. He's not among the dead. I like this. He is not here, but has been raised. And then, and then again, this is God speaking through the angels. Remember how he, capital H, he, the Lord Jesus, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. And the Lord spoke to them saying, you know, the son of man has to be delivered into the son of hands of sinful men, be crucified on the third day and rise up. Then it says this, they remembered his rhema. They remembered his words. His, his logos became the instant speaking of the Lord to them. Now, let's come to D. D says, as the life-giving spirit, Christ is the speaking spirit. Whatever he speaks is the word that washes us. This does not refer to logos, the constant word, but to rhema, which denotes an instant word, the word that the Lord presently speaks to us. Now, saints, when we pray over the word, and we all need to have uh, um, a personal, affectionate, private, and spiritual relationship with the Lord, and um, I would, you know, these four words, you know, Brother Lee said, I was in, there were a few co-workers there. He said, the Lord gave me these words personal, affectionate, private, and spiritual. Oh, I felt so privileged to hear those four words. Uh, they, they're very meaningful, very deep. Well, saints, we, we need to have a personal relationship with the Lord. I'm just going to use two of these words. And a private relationship with the Lord. We need to have private times with the Lord. If we don't, that's detrimental to the church. Why do I spend a private time with the Lord, because that's where the Lord can shine on me, in me. That's where the Lord can deal with things in my being that don't match him. In that private time, that's where the Lord shines on me, and I can confess my sins. In that private time, that's where I can speak to the Lord about anything and everything uh, that troubles me, or that I'm even happy about. You know, one time, um, oh, we've got this book, and I can't remember the name of it right now, but it tells this story of C.A. Spurgeon, who was very much used by the Lord in the past, and he and his colleague were riding horses. And all of a sudden, he said to his colleague, he said, he, he stopped his horse, his colleague stopped. He didn't know what Spurgeon was doing. He said, let's get down from our horses right now. 
kneel down and thank the Lord Jesus for this wonderful day that we can ride these horses together. I think that's wonderful. We need to speak. Oh, I know what the, I know what the name of the booklet is now. Tell him. Tell him. Speak to him about everything. Speak. You know, don't. When you're with the Lord, you can't pretend. Uh, speak to him without pretense. If you're sorrowful, tell him your sorrows. If you're miserable. Tell him, tell him what's on your heart. Lord, I'm miserable. What's wrong? Bring me into the light of your presence. Your joy is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Lord, restore to me the joy, the gladness of my salvation. That's Psalm 51. You can converse with the Lord like this. Uh, and remember, the Lord himself in Matthew 14, after he fed the 5,000, this is in verse 22 and 23, he, uh, instead of having an after meeting, quote, quote, after meeting, which is probably what I would have done, I would have said, let's stay here and have testimonies. Look, it's just 15,000 people, men, not including women and children. That was an amazing thing. But you know what the Lord did? Immediately. He told the disciples, uh, it says he compelled them, it's a strong word, to get in a boat and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Then it says he sent the crowds away. And then it says he went up to the mountain, listen to this word, privately, privately to pray. If you look at the footnote, well, I believe it might be on verse 22, but look at the notes on verse 14, 22 through 23. It says, it says something like this. The Lord Jesus wanted more time to pray privately to the Father that he might have the Father with him in whatever he did for the producing and establishing of his kingdom on this earth. Saints, this footnote, the Lord wanted more time to pray privately to the Father. Saints, if the Lord Jesus wanted more time to pray privately, how about us? Uh, we, <laughs> this is the Lord Jesus. He wanted more time to pray privately to the Father. We should be the same way. We should even have prayer. Lord, I like to pray. Uh, give me more time to pray privately to you. I don't know how he would do that with each one of us. It'll be maybe in a particular way, but that's a good prayer to pray. Now, you know, uh, you remember where the Lord says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every rhema that proceeds out through the mouth of God. Every word is every rhema. Then in John 6, 63, he said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words which I have spoken to you, that is the plural, the plural of rhema. The words which I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Now, I'll, I'll just say this very briefly. Notice that I have three verses uh, as a, after the CF, CF period of Isaiah, Matthew, and Acts. This is quite amazing. In Isaiah 6, 9 through 10, you have the father speaking to the stubborn children of Israel, saying to Isaiah, go and say to this people, hear indeed, but do not perceive, see indeed, but do not understand, make the heart of this people numb, dull their ears, seal their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and their heart perceive and return, and they are healed. That was the Father speaking. Now, Matthew 13, you have the Son speaking to the rejecting Jews. And he quotes Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. That's what the Father spoke. And uh, I like what the Lord Jesus spoke, because he said, 
lest they perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and they turn around, and I will hear them. That, that portion has really convicted me in the past, because sometimes we're, the Lord is behind us. We, we're fully turned away from him. He wants us to turn around so that he can heal us. Uh, so you have the son speaking in Matthew 13. Then in Acts 28, you have the spirit speaking the same word through the apostle Paul. It's quite amazing. Father, the son, and the spirit speaking the same thing. And in Acts 28, what you have is the spirit speaking to the hard-hearted people. Now let's come to E. He says the rhema reveals something to us personally and directly. It shows us what we need to deal with and what we need to be cleansed from. The laver of bronze was a mirror that could reflect and expose. The important thing for each one of us is this. Is God speaking his word to me today? That's the most important thing for each one of us. Is God speaking his word to you, to me, today? Uh, today is a big word in the Bible. You know, Exodus 38, 8 says that the labor of bronze was made out of the mirrors of the serving women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Well, all those mirrors were put together they became one bronze mirror. And so, saints, um, when you come to the Bible, when you come to this book, and, uh, you know, this Bible is recovery version. Uh, this is recovery version without the footnotes. Uh, you know, the one, one with the footnotes is like this big, right? Um, I didn't bring that one with me. Uh, maybe because of my physical weakness. Uh, but I'm glad for that big one. Hallelujah. That is wonderful. I think you could carry that around all over the world and get people saved, regenerated, sanctified, transformed, conformed for their glorification to become the new Jerusalem. You know, Brother Lee said this. He said, even take these footnotes and read them to unbelievers. You know, there was a, there was a, you know, a, a number of the brothers in Spokane know this, that there were brothers who, who visited you at one time, Jim, you know this, and they said that for the new ones, they passed out the new international version. Now, I'm not critica criticizing that version, and they even went so far to say, with the new ones, don't give them the recovery version at first. Give them the new international version. When I heard that from a, a certain brother whom I love, who was to me is a pillar in the church, oh my goodness. Um, I was shocked. So the next co-workers meeting I was in, I said, brothers, um, I heard this speaking was going around, and then I, I read to the coworkers everything Brother Lee said about the recovery version with the footnotes. He said, you should read this footnote, these footnotes to the unbelievers, even. Read these footnotes to everyone. Uh, in other words, you need to read the recovery version of people. No other version. You can get people saved through one of these notes. Am I right, saints? You know, I'm looking at Oswo and Jim. Am I right, brothers? Surely you can. Listen, this is our cargo. Our cargo has nothing to do with what's in fallen Christendom. Um, Oh, my goodness, Lord Jesus. So I read this to the brothers, quote after quote after quote after quote. Eventually, that speaking about, you know, use the New International Version that totally was vaporized and disappeared 
from the face of the earth among the coworkers. And I'm so thankful for that uh, because I want to be one with Brother Lee up until the time I meet with the Lord. And I want to be one with him intrinsically in both his speaking and his doings. Uh, so I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to speak that. You know, right after I spoke, the next day, Dennis, we came to have another meeting, and Dennis Higashi stood up and spoke. He said, brothers, I cannot believe that this was spoken, you know, what Ed shared. And then he, Dennis had a number of quotes that brother he said about using the recovery version uh, to shepherd people, even to get people saved. Okay, now, let me go on to F. Uh, forgive me, I got, maybe that was a sidebar, but maybe it wasn't a sidebar. Saints, hallelujah for the recovery version with the footnotes. You know, D.L. Moody said this. He said, if all the books in the, word, in the world were to be burned, just give me my Bible and C.H. McIntosh's notes on the Pentateuch. If D.O. Moody was with us today, he would say, if all the books in the world were to be burned, just give me that recovery version with the footnotes. He might add, give me that recovery version with the, with the collective works of Watchmen and the collective works of Witness Lee. You know, if he might add, he could add that too. But if you, if you want to abbreviate it, with the footnotes. Um, now, F says, one thing that we always treasure, and we treasure this in this meeting, is that the Lord still speaks to us. Isn't that marvelous, saints? The Lord is still speaking to us. You know, after Brother Lee departed to be with the Lord, there's some of you out there that know Chinese, and Andrew, Brother Andrew told me about this, that after Brother Lee went to be with the Lord, there were some, some, some people, maybe even among us, uh, and for sure opposers outside of us, they said, well, what's going to happen to them now that Brother Lee has departed to be with the Lord? He's no longer among them physically. What are they going to do? And then there's this saying in Chinese that translated into English, means this, when the tree falls, the monkeys are scattered. In other words, Brother Lee was the tree, and we're the monkeys. Tree fell, monkeys are scattered. The saint, the monkeys are still here. Uh, forgive me, I'm using that illustration. Actually, we're God men. We're still here. And the Lord is still speaking to us personally and directly today. True growth in life depends upon our receiving the word, listen, directly from God. Only his speaking in us has true spiritual value. You know, I don't have this verse on here, but I could not, this morning, I thought of Ezekiel 1, 3. Actually, the first three verses of Ezekiel 1, it says that the heavens were open to Ezekiel. He saw visions of God. And then it says, the word came expressly to Ezekiel. That's what we need. We need an express word to us. Um, like, um, oh, I'm thinking of these car car carriers, you know, uh, Federal Express. We need a Federal Express word to each one of us. Uh, anyway, we need God's express personal speaking. Now, these verses in Hebrews, why do I put these verses on here? Because it has this one word is very important. Today, if you hear his voice, do not pardon your hearts. It says this three times in these Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. Today, if you hear his voice, 
do not harden your hearts. Saints, we only have today, this day, the Lord's day. We do not have tomorrow. The devil always wants us to think about, oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Tomorrow. Remember the Lord in, in Matthew 5 through 7, that's the constitution of the kingdom of the heavens. He said, do not be anxious for tomorrow. For tomorrow, be anxious for itself. He said something like this. In other words, we are not people of tomorrow, nor are we people of the past. Uh, we might think, oh, it was so glorious in my past when I came into church life. Now I'm miserable. What about the future? No, today. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have today. Forget about the past. Forget about tomorrow. Uh, you know, the enemy always wants us to look at tomorrow. Ed, how are you going to make it? You know, I have a lot ahead of me. I have a lot of important things to do for the Lord's interest. Now, the enemy would use that and say, Ed, how are you going to do that? That's impossible for you to do that uh, after this conference. Well, I would say this. What's impossible with man is possible with God. Uh, listen, we live in the realm of impossibility. That's resurrection. Okay, but saints, I want you to be impressed with the word today if you hear his voice. Now, Jesus the central point of our prayers should be our longing for the Lord speaking, which enables us to fulfill the goal of his eternal economy, according to his heart's desire, to have a bride as his counterpart. So Revelation 2, 7 says that we need to be the overcomers who have an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When we come to 1 Samuel 3, which we'll talk about in the upcoming training, you remember, you remember that Samuel and Eli? You know, with Eli, it was the stale ironic priesthood. But thank the Lord, there was a God-chosen little boy in the temple. And uh, he heard God's voice, Samuel, Samuel. And so Samuel, he thought it was Eli. And so he went to Eli. Eli woke up. Samuel told him, uh, Eli, were you, uh, you know, were you calling me? He said, no, 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 go back to sleep. Well, that happened two more times. Eventually, Eli got the message. He said, oh, my goodness. He said, the next time you hear Samuel, 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 I want you to say that. Speak, oh, Jehovah, your servant is listening. So that's what Samuel said. He said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. The Lord needs us to be just like that. We need to have a continual attitude. Lord, speak to me, your, your servant. I'm your servant, and I am listening. Uh, Saints, I hope you're listening this morning. Why are you listening? Uh, you know, it's possible to hear words, but you don't actually hear the Lord's personal, direct, instant speaking to you. That's a tragedy. Uh, this prayer, speak, O Jehovah, your servant is listening. That should be the golden line that runs through our whole Christian life and church life. You know, we have a book called by Brother Nee and or the Collective Works of Watchman Nee. It's called The Character of God's Workman. The first chapter, the title of that chapter is A Good Listener. If you're going to serve the Lord, you need to be a good listener. Firstly, you need to be a, a good listener of the Lord speaking. You need to listen to his speaking. You need to be like Mary every day who sat at the Lord's feet and who was listening to his word. 
Saints, every day we need to put the brakes on, sit at the Lord's feet, and listen to his word. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't serve the Lord, but what it does mean is we need to hear the Lord speaking to us so that when we do serve the Lord, we serve him according to his desire and according to his preference, which was infused into us because we stopped everything, sat at his feet, and listened to his word. And so 1 Samuel 3 goes on to say that uh, the boy Samuel ministered to Jehovah. It says the word of Jehovah was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. You know, saints, it is, it is, it is just purely the Lord's mercy that the word of the triune God is not rare to us in these days. I am so thankful for this, and I believe with all my heart, one of the reasons it is not rare is that the Lord is close to returning. He wants to come back. And so he wants us to hear his rhema word every day because that's how we will be prepared to be his bride. And he cannot come back unless the bride is prepared. So thank the Lord for his speaking you know, in us and in the local churches. Uh, and then it says at the end of 1 Samuel 3, it says Jehovah revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of Jehovah. Now listen to what Amos 3, 7 says. It says, surely the Lord Jehovah will not do anything unless he reveals his secret to his servants the prophets. Uh, anyway, I, I'm very impressed with that verse. Uh, the Lord can't do anything uh, unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets, through his, through his speaking to the prophets. Now, Ain says, in a very practical sense, the Lord's presence is one with his speaking. Whenever he speaks, we realize his presence within us, it goes on even more specifically to say this, saints, Christ speaking is the very presence of the life-giving spirit. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you love the presence of the life-giving spirit? His speaking to us is the presence of the life-giving spirit. I goes on to say the speaking of the indwelling Christ as the life-giving spirit within us is the cleansing water that deposits a new element into us to replace the old element in our nature and disposition. This metabolic cleansing causes a genuine and inward change in life, which is the reality of dispositional sanctification and transformation. So we, again, Oh, Lord Jesus, speak to us all day long today, Lord. Speak, oh, Lord, your servant is listening. Oh, Lord Jesus, may it happen to me according to your rhema. Um, anyway, this is what we want. We want to be a part, a constituent of that glorious bride of Christ. Now, you know, it's interesting, and that chapter on being a good listener, Brother Nee talks about this. I'll just say this briefly. He says, you know, when you're shepherding people, the first thing you have to do is listen to what the person is saying. You know, saints, a lot of times someone, we're with a, a particular brother or sister, and they're speaking something to us, and we're not listening to them. If they stopped, after they said, they said, and they said, uh, Oh, Brother so, so what did I just say to you? You might not be able to tell them because you weren't actually listening to them. You were thinking about what you were going to say. You were thinking about what you had. Instead, the first aspect of being a good listener is to listen to what the person is saying. 
You know, when I sat on that front row, I asked the Lord every time for mercy. Lord, grant me your mercy to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the churches. Make me a, a good listener in this meeting. And you know, saints, I, you may have seen, there were a number of times where Brother Lee called on me. And he said, Ed, speak what I just said. And so I sometimes I would have a failing grade, but a lot of times I would get an A. You know, I remember one time I, I said, so I just shared what Brother Lee shared. And Brother Lee said, I want everybody to be like Brother Ed Marks and say what he said over the whole globe, which what I said was what Brother Lee said, and what Brother Lee said was what the Lord said. Uh, so anyway, my point, let me come back to this. When you shepherd people, you need to listen to them, number one. Number two, you need to listen to what the Spirit is speaking. Listen to what they say. Listen to what the Spirit says. That he says, the Spirit says something to you for them. Third, listen to what they are not saying. Listen to what, what they are saying. Listen to what the Spirit is saying, and listen to what they are not saying. Then you will be able to be one with Christ as the good shepherd of the sheep. Now, let's come to the final Roman numeral, which is quite remarkable. It says, uh, no, it's not the final Roman numeral. I'm sorry. Okay. Stay with me, saints. I, I know I haven't managed my time very well, but please stay with me. I love all of you. And, and this is very priceless. Listen, Ephesians 5.27 reveals that the church as the bride of Christ will eventually become a glorious church, which is a God-expressing church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that she would be holy and without blemish. Now, A says, the beauty of the bride comes from the very Christ who is wrought into the church and who is then expressed through the church. Our only beauty is the shining out of Christ from within us. And so if you look at Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 5, in verse 1 it says, Arise! Exclamation point. Shine! Exclamation point. Saint, that is a command in the scriptures. Shine! exclamation point. Because in Matthew 5, 16, the Lord said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Of course, the good works there are our living out of Christ, and any good works we have are our living out of Christ, and Christ flowing out of us to do his work. And then that becomes Good work. Okay, so Isaiah 60, 60 verse 1 commands us to shine. You know what verse 5 says? It says, then you will see. And I still remember I shared this in Spokane. Then you will see and you will beam. You will beam. I remember I said in Spokane, we all need to be beamers. And then some of the young younger brothers, they said, Ed, you know, a beamer is a BMW. <laughs> I was glad to know that, you know, in the, in the natural realm, the, uh, the young people called BMWs, Beamers. But I told the saints and I told the young people, I'm not talking about BMWs. I'm talking about you beaming the Lord into others. Are you a Beamer? The light has to shine in our being to such an extent that we beam him into others. In my first church meeting, uh, I'll try to abbreviate it. I was, I was, uh, came in the meeting. I felt so out of place. I was somewhat afraid to look up after the prayer meeting was over. I'd never heard prayer like that. I'd never seen people like that. So I slowly wrote, lifted my head up and I looked up. There was this brother right across from me. I tell you, his face was shining. He looking at me. He beamed Christ into me. He didn't say one word. I could never forget his shining face. He's with the Lord now. I can never forget that. 
That is beholding and reflecting, beholding for yourself, reflecting into others as a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Now let's come to B. B says, for the bride to be prepared means that she is clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, which is the righteousness of the saints. Listen, this fine linen is the beauty of the bride. Now, when the word says righteousness says, what that means is we enjoy Christ as our subjective righteousness, our experiential, experiential, our experiential and enjoyable righteousness. And when he lived out from us, what we do are righteousness says. Uh, we live, we, we, um, we live because of Christ. We live by Christ. We live out Christ. And, uh, and God operates in us uh, to make us willing for his good pleasure. God is the one who operates in you for the willing and working of his good pleasure. So that working of his good pleasure becomes our righteousness says. And that is the beauty of the bride. Now, C says, on the day of his wedding, saints, don't you want to be there on the day of Christ's wedding? I wish I could just see you all, but I can see who I need to see. Uh, I know all you can see me, and I hope you say amen to this. Don't you want to be there on the day of Christ's wedding? Amen. We do. That's what the Lord's recovery is for. A bride, listen to this, a bridegroom cares much more for the beauty of his bride than for her ability. You know, Brother Jim, I'm using you as an example, Brother Jim Clark. I can see Jim, and I could use myself as an example too, Jim, but I'll use you, and I can use me. You know, Jim, when we married our wives, we didn't know what their abilities were, did we? We didn't know if they, they were good cooks. Can they sew? How do they vacuum the carpet? All we saw was their beauty. You know, there was a, a, a and what I mean by beauty, because they were believers, there was an inward beauty in them. Am I right, Jim? That's right, brother. And that inward beauty shined out of them. And so... You were, Jim, you and I were enthralled by our spouses, weren't we? That is right, brother. Amen. We were. And I hope we're still being enthralled, brother. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let me go on. The Lord Jesus, our God, cares primarily for the beauty of himself expressed through our humanity. We need to be beautified by Christ day by day so that we can be prepared to be presented to him as his lovely bride. D goes on to say, whenever we take time, oh, saints, take time every day to behold the beauty of the Lord in his word. How? By pray reading and musing upon his word, he becomes our beauty, and we are beautified by him to become the house of his beauty so that he also may be beautified. Have you ever realized before that the church in Spokane is the house of the triune God's beauty? Same with the church in Bellevue, Atsuo. The church is the house of the living God. The church is also the house of his beauty. Saints, in this meeting, and, and uh, I know I'm going, going longer, but forget about that. Just behold the beauty of the Lord. Listen, I told the Lord one day recently in my time with him, I said, you know, Lord Jesus, you know, I say simple things to the Lord. M maybe sometimes I'll say this, though. I said, Lord, I know that you know this. But I'm going to tell you anyway, because I need to hear it too. And so I said to the Lord, Lord Jesus, just recently, I said, you have never disappointed me 
and you never will disappoint me. Um, isn't that true? I like to behold his beauty. And so uh, by pray reading, musing upon the word, he becomes our beauty. And the church is the house of his beauty. Now, if you look at all these verses, you know, Psalm 27, 4, David said, I just want one thing from the Lord to behold his beauty. These verses in Isaiah, I'll just say different phrases from them. The Lord says, I will beautify the house of my beauty. Yes, the church is the house of my beauty, but I'm going to make her even more beautiful right now in this meeting. I'm going to beautify the house of my beauty. And then another verse says, the Holy One of Israel, for he has beautified you. And then Isaiah 60, verse 19 says, your God, your beauty. Who is our beauty? God is our beauty. The Christ who is brought into us and expressed through us is our beauty. Apart from that, everything about us is ugly. Sorry, maybe you didn't think that, but it's true. Our only beauty is God. God is our beauty. Specifically speaking, God is the very Christ who is brought into us and expressed through us. That is our beauty. He is our beauty. Then he says that I may be beautified. So on the one hand, he beautifies him. He beautifies us with himself as our beauty, so that he can be beautified uh, when his divine attributes become our human virtues. He's beautified. Okay, now let's come to E, the washing of the water in the word. In Ephesians 5, 26, deals mainly with spots and wrinkles. Spots refer to something of the natural life, and wrinkles are related to oldness. Saints don't become old. Don't become stale. Don't become lukewarm. You know, we need to, sometimes we need to pray, Lord, save me from being lukewarm. Save me from being stale. Save me from being old, Lord. I like to be new. I like to be fresh. I like to be on fire for you, Lord. Not with natural enthusiasm. I want you to be my fire. Uh, Anyway, only the water of life can metabolically wash away such defects by the transformation of life. As it says to be holy is to be saturated with Christ and transformed by Christ. And to be without blemish is to be spotless and without wrinkle, having nothing of the natural life of our old man. You know, saints, I have a song of Psalms 4-7. And the Lord here is addressing his loving seeker. And I, re I pray for myself, firstly, I pray for all of you, that the Lord would be able to say this to us. Here's what he says to his seeker. You are altogether beautiful, my love, and there is no blemish in you. Well, isn't that wonderful if the Lord would speak that to you? You are altogether beautiful, my love. And there is no blemish in you. So G goes on to say, also the church will not have any such things, which means that she will not have this or that kind of defect. God will bring the church to the place where nothing can be said against her in any respect. Now let's come to Roman numeral 6, which is the last Roman numeral. Uh, it says this, Ephesians 5, 26 through 27 Matches Song of Songs 8, 13 through 14. Both reveal that it is by the Lord speaking to us that we are prepared to be his glorious bride with a desire for his second coming. Now listen to what Song of Songs 8, 13 through 14 says. The loving seeker says this, Oh, you who dwell in the gardens. The gardens are his believers. Oh, you who dwell in the gardens, my companions, her companions are also believers. My companions, listen for your voice. Let me hear it. Other translations say, cause me to hear it. Since we need to tell the Lord this, Lord, let me hear your voice today. And then 14, verse 14 says, 
Make haste, my beloved. That means, Lord, make haste to return in your second coming. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young heart upon the mountains of spices. So A says, in the Song of Songs, the loving seeker of Christ asks him who dwells in the believers as his gardens to let her hear his voice while her companions listen for her voice, listen for his voice. Saints, I believe all of you are listening for God's voice. And so I would just ask the Lord, even right now, Lord, let me hear your voice while my companions are listening for your voice right now. Uh, now, one says, this indicates that in the work, we as the lovers of, what we as the lovers of Christ do for him as our beloved, when we work together with him, we need to maintain our fellowship with him, always listening to him. Two says, our lives depend on the Lord's words. Think about that, saints. Our very Christian life depend on the Lord's words, and our work depends on his commands. Without the Lord's words, we will not have any revelation, light, or personal knowledge of Christ as our King, our Lord, our head, and our husband. You know, saints, I hope you pick up this, these words. Uh, in the last training, we pointed this out. And, you know, since that time, I've just Almost on a daily basis, I've been saying, Lord, today I take you as my king, take you as my Lord, I take you as my head, and I take you as my husband. This goes on to say the life of the believers hinges totally upon the Lord speaking. This brings us to B. B says, as the concluding prayer of this poetic book, the lover of Christ prays that her beloved would her beloved would make haste to come back in the power of his resurrection, signified by the gazelle and the young heart, to set up his sweet and beautiful kingdom, his sweet and beautiful kingdom, which is signified by the mountains of spices, which will fill the whole earth. Isn't that wonderful, saints? Uh, the verses 13 and 14. Uh, Talk about our longing for the Lord speaking so that he can come back in the power of his resurrection to set up his sweet and beautiful kingdom on this earth. That one says, such a prayer portrays the union and communion between Christ as the bridegroom and his lovers as the bride in their bridal love. In the way that the prayer of John, a lover of Christ, as the concluding word of the Holy Scriptures reveals God's eternal economy concerning Christ and the church in his divine love. Now, I, now I would like to say a little bit about that, but I'll, I'll read two first. Two says, come Lord Jesus is the last prayer in the Bible. Also, do you like that last prayer? I do too, brother. Come, Lord Jesus. Listen, the entire Bible concludes with the desire for the Lord's coming expressed as a prayer. Saints, I would say this. Listen closer to me. The entire Bible ends with pray reading. Why do I say that? Listen to verse Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies these things says, yes, I come quickly. What did John do? He just prayed the Lord's word back to him. He pray, read the Lord's very speaking back to him. He said, the first thing uh, John said was, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The Lord said, yes, I come quickly. So John said, I'm just going to pray this back to the Lord. Amen. Let it be so, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. So that brings us to three. That's the the desire for the Lord's coming expressed as a prayer, then three is beautiful. 
This is at the end of Watch for Nee's exposition of the Song of Songs. Listen to this. When he comes, faith will return to facts and praise will replace prayer. Love will consummate in a shadowless perfection and we will serve him in the sinless domain. What a day that will be. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Isn't that glorious, saints? Uh, anyway, this is the process of dispositional sanctification as the process of our organic salvation, which is our beautification to become the holy and glorious bride of, for Christ. Okay, I went over time. You know, Jim, maybe, uh, Jim, it's up to you, but maybe we can take a, maybe five more minutes if you feel to do. I, I just stand with you, brother, whatever you feel. Mm-hmm.